40 years ago, my God. Hello, I'm Bob Harris, and you find me here in West London, outside of what used to be called the Hammersmith Odeon. And we're retracing old footsteps about the concert that we broadcast on the old grey whistle test on BBC television in Christmas 1975. It was the time when Bohemian Rhapsody was number one in the charts, and the band had just come to the end of their most successful concert tour so far. <laughs> <laughs> Mosquitoes everywhere. <laughs> so what do you remember about the lead-up to the concert at uh, Hammersmith Odeon? Well, it was a whole tour, as Roger was just reminding me. We'd done a fairly extensive British tour, which was our second solo British tour, with four nights at the Hammersmith Odeon. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So then an extra night was booked for the, the Christmas Eve concert, live. Live and very dangerous. It wasn't. It was live, live. Totally. Yes. Because they were also, you know, BBC were linking up the sound and the concert was being broadcast in the stereo, wasn't it, on Radio yes. 1? it was indeed, yeah. The big difference on that tour from the previous one was that we had this... Uh, the beginnings of some TV reinforcement. Because TV makes all the difference. It's TV which makes you stopped in the street. It makes people feel like they know you. We were still very poor. Nothing had changed from that point of view. Because uh, we were still, I think we were on 20 quid a week at that point, you know, from our managers are all building their swimming pools and driving around running their Rolls Royces, and you're thinking, hmm, <laughs> where did it all go? You know, so there was definitely a management crisis coming along. Um, but we had the external trappings of being stars, and I'm sure everybody thought we were millionaires. Mm. Freddie's quoted as saying he would never go on a bus, but I went on a lot of buses with Fred. I gotta tell you, in the days when we were signed to Trident Audio Productions, but nothing was happening. And David Bowe was appearing at um, Finsbury Park, or the Rainbow, you know, and uh, all kinds of people were having hits who we regarded as our generation, and nothing was happening with us. We would go up every day, me and Freddie, on the bus, the top at the front, and sit there, and um, I think it was the number nine, and uh, we'd go up to Trident Audio Productions and sit in their offices and say, what is happening? And I, having been through that for a long time, I mean, I went on the tube for years as well when I was um, teaching at a comprehensive school just prior to that. So I kind of paid my dues on public transport. But I don't want to go back to public, given the choice, I don't, I don't want to go back. You know, I haven't seen the inside of a bus for a while. What are buses like? <laughs> <laughs> we felt this is make or break, really. Um, we were personally broke, having, uh, you know, had a lot of um, uh, problems with our management at the time who weren't really giving us the money we were earning. And uh, so we, this is really hard. This is a big last shot, you know, bang. But we ended up um, going with John Reed, who was Elton's manager at the time, and, and uh, there was a, a moment where John said, OK, I can now do this. You're, you're going to be free of your old commitments to Trident. And you go away and make the best record you've ever made, and I will sort out the money side. So I think he put us on, like, 30 quid a week instead of 20 quid a week, and we were made. <laughs> no, it was a bit... A little bit better than that. I had great faith in Bohemian Rhapsody, and uh, Freddie had always incredible self-belief. But it really was, you know, it was a very eclectic album, and it's, it was either going to be something that worked or really didn't work. If we hadn't made a night at the opera and Bohemian Rhapsody hadn't been the huge hit that it was, it's questionable whether we would have been able to carry on. When you're in debt, people don't want to hire you PAs and lights and... <laughs> You know, it becomes very difficult if you're in debt for a long time, which we were. We felt unfashionable, but that we were, had the strength of mind to realise that unfashionable wasn't necessarily a bad thing, because I think if, you know, the, you could see uh, people liking our music, I mean, a lot of people. The Japan experience was something we'll never forget, for sure. Before we went, they said, you know, you're really very popular and people are very excited about you coming. And we thought, oh, yeah, you know, I suppose it'll be okay. 
But to arrive at the airport and thousands of fans there screaming, you know, treating us like the Beatles going to America, was a shock and very unreal, actually. Bow Rap was at number one at this moment. It had been at the top of the charts now for three weeks. A night at the opera went to number one three days after the concert itself. This was the transition moment, wasn't it, for you? Suddenly being catapulted into a, a kind of different level. Well, we'd had a lot of success with the third album, Sheer Heart Attack, which we had Killer Queen and uh, Now I'm Here From. And things were looking great, but suddenly that album and with that single, it did sort of take us onto another level. And we saw the power of the video as well, which came out of the, the song Bohemian Rhapsody, which we made a video for simply because we were on tour and we weren't able to go on Top of the Pops. Mm. Well, also, I mean, the fact that you didn't appear live on Top of the Pops meant that that video ran, didn't it, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, I think they, they got so sick of running that video, they sort of put flames on it to make it look a bit different. Reality, open your eyes, look up to the skies and see. We can do a sound check for you now if you, if you want. The cameras are having a rest. Before, before I forget, Bob Harris is going to use this, going to use John's mic for the very start, OK? I remember coming on to, to the audience. We normally did a big dramatic entrance and everything was dark and there was lots of noise and smoke and dry ice and explosions and stuff. And so it gave you great confidence coming on the stage. On this occasion, they had the audience lit for TV. So we went on stage and all the lights are on and there's complete silence. So it was a strange moment. And you, you have that kind of doubt in your stomach as to whether this is going to work. You know, maybe they're going to go, oh, God, and all walk out. You know, you, you have no idea in that sort of... Um, that moment of expectation. So it was quite strange and eerie and nerve-wracking. It was new to me, because we hadn't done telly before, really. And um, not only that, they weren't ready for us. They, had, they were saying, no, 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 another two minutes, just hold it, you know, and then 10, 9, 8, whatever. So you're doing all this in front of your audience, and it was really strange, because we weren't communicating. It was like there was a, a wall, sort of a transparent wall there, and then suddenly it was going to come down. <laughs> But it did. As soon as we were, we were on, we were on, and it suddenly everything changed, and the audience kind of got up um, and did a lot of waving, a lot of noise, which was great, and we were into it. But I remember that first moment as being quite um, un unreal, really. Very strange. So I came on and introduced you. I was wearing my top hat and my white white tux. Very glam, Bob. Looking, looking very glamorous and uh, not. This is an old great <laughs> special. We're joined this evening live at the Hammersmith Odeon by many, many people watching at home on television. And all really I'd uh, like to ask you to do is to welcome on stage the band this evening. We're presenting a night at the opera. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Queen. And the set started with Now I'm Here. Which, of course, on tour had been very mysterious because no one, no one had seen us in the dark and suddenly flash, flash. There's Freddie, and then flash, flash, and there's Freddie somewhere else. You know, so out, coming out of this again, a little odd, really. But you had to go from naught to 100 miles an hour. I think we we got into it very quickly, and there was a feeling of drama, and the sound was good. I seem to remember that Hammersmith Odeon wasn't always the easiest place for sound, was it? You know, it's a good dry for, place. It's a difficult yeah, place. A good place to see someone. It still is actually. Hammersmith Odeon was sort of our local, I suppose. So yes, we we wanted to play there. It's a strange feeling being at home. I think we really felt we had to, to work very hard in England to prove that we were the real deal. And it came in the end. But Hammersmith Odeon, this gig that you see here, is right on the, the cusp of this. I think we were still quite shocked and thrilled that people got that excited about us. We didn't take that in any way for granted. Mm. Well, Ogre Battle came next, didn't it? Ogre Battle. <laughs> I think there was a, 
a real freedom in those days because we were playing exactly what we felt like and there was no constraint as regards play the hits or whatever because we didn't have that many hits. So yes, it was very much um, play the album tracks and, and portray the full breadth of what we were trying to be. We had a vision, you know, this kind of very heavy undertow and glittering harmonies and searing vocals on top. So we were just about beginning to, to achieve that on stage, to achieve the, uh, the goal that we set ourselves. <laughs> Darlings, this is a little delicate little number called White Queen. Lyrically, it might have seemed like escapism, what we were doing, but I don't think we were trying to escape. I think we were bound up in our own fantasy worlds, really, quite uh, instinctively. On such a breathless night as this, on my brow, the light is kissed, so I'm so lost. We just did what was, was in our hearts and minds and very unselfconsciously really. I don't think we necessarily looked for, for escapism in music, although it probably it's there. And then there was the bow rap killer queen, black queen medley. Um, with Freddie at piano. And I mean, this was really the first time that most people would have seen Bo Rap as a live experience mm -hmm. on this particular concert. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the piano just added a different sound and a different texture, didn't it? Freddie was a great player. Yes, he was. was. A wonderful player, sometimes underestimated, even by himself, I have to say, because later on he didn't want to play piano, he wanted other people to play it for him. But he had this wonderful percussive rhythmic touch yeah unequaled actually and he, he could just drive the band effortlessly he was yeah. fantastic to play with he really was it, it really for, yeah. especially for a drummer it's, it's amazing uh, rhythm rhythmic sense yeah. actually yeah. yeah like this you'll notice not the way you're, you're taught to play like this pretty was played like that yes oh, yeah, this whole... and also the, the left hand was crossing over the right, wasn't it? It was coming There's a lot of that going on. It was the, just trying to show off his nail <laughs> Really, what a poser. <laughs> <laughs> Killer Queen, the song, it's a very sophisticated and quite light record. And I remember having some doubts about it because it, I thought, you know, perhaps it uh, gives the wrong idea about what we might be like on stage. Um, but, you know, a good song is a good song and a hit is a hit. And it was the right thing to do because it got us to a very broad audience. And uh, to my mind, looking back, I think it's a very good rock song and I think it's probably one of the better records we ever made. Um, artistically, it all fits together wonderfully and you know, a lot of that is just Freddie. We're now gonna feature Brian, Brian May on guitar. And this number is entitled Brighton Rock. Long guitar solo in Brighton Rock, um, Brian. Mm. Which never went away. <laughs> became something else, became sort of transformed over the years. That was the beginning of doing that kind of um, uh, playing with my own echo kind of mm. experience, mm. You know, which has sort of developed over the years. Playing with yourself, I nearly said that, Rod, but I avoided I it very carefully. Don't worry. You can rely on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've taken our show around the world, but we've never got to so many people all at once. And this felt really good. Thanks a lot for giving us a good year. We'd like to leave you in the lap of the gods. The next in the set at the Hammersmith Odeon, Keep Yourself Alive, and then Liar, and then In the Lap of the Gods. And that's the, the main body of the set. You came off stage there for a while. Lap of the Gods was a great closer for yes. the main part of the show. Yeah. We always loved it, didn't we? It's very... We did, actually. That was before So sort of We Are the Champions, and that, that was our yeah. champions pre champions you definitely know. Yeah. And, and it was a great anthem of freddy's again and uh, yeah very suitable for that yeah. moment very epic mm. and then there was that great rock and roll medley back on stage to do rock and roll yeah well it began with big spender which was very very much a freddy thing you know and we loved it it's uh, it was something really fun you had to smile you had to really get into it you've done your show you've done what you came there to do and you've given people their money's worth 
Um, and it's like you have license to just have fun. And it's a, I think that's a special moment. We always thought it was a great time. So we don't do our own songs anymore. We do other people's songs where you can feel really free. So in a way, all the, the barriers are down. The audience are, and us are almost indistinguishable. We're just having a good time. And we love that rock and roll stuff. It suited Freddie very well, I've got to say. <laughs> It's very rock and roll, isn't it? Yeah. But then, <laughs> Jailhouse Rock, Stupid Cupid, the old Connie Francis. Stupid Cupid. Freddie would sing any words that came into his head. So, you know, we'd be playing some 12-bar stuff and suddenly he would sing Stupid Cupid, so you'd find the riff and that was it, really. We, we were very loose. You know, mm. you would, it wouldn't always be Stupid Cupid, would it? it would be... No, no, it might be something else. It might be Tutti Frutti or, yeah, or something. Yeah. And you'd have to turn on the sixpence and, and go with it. And you follow know. the lead. Stupid Cupid, stop playing that game. Then it says Stupid Cupid and then Beep Up Alula. Right. Yeah, again, you know, that's loose. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. anything could happen in that part of the show. Yeah. And all, yeah. all this bit was really, it was sort of, you have a basic sort of idea and then, and it's, mm. it can go sort of in several directions. So it, it used to change a bit every night. That was that little it's medley. Funny. Roger and I had already been playing for a long time together mm. by the time this happened. You know, before Queen, we were playing together. We play almost as one unit, Roger and me, once we get going once we relax. Um, so doing sort of old rock and roll stuff is a good place to, to stretch out and, again, just enjoy, just get into a groove. Um, very enjoyable, still is, still enjoyable to do that stuff. But, you know, it's not quite the same without Fred. Or John, you know, we don't have John these days around. I mean, John would thunder away and they, they were good days. You know, it was a great, great, a very strong unit. John was completely in rapport with, with Roger's bass drum. You know, you, you couldn't separate them. Amazing, the, the cohesion that was there. And of course, Freddie was Freddie and would, would do anything, you know, what he felt like. There were, there were no boundaries for Freddie. Fred just wanted to shock people and, and piss them off, maybe, or, or, or just make them laugh as well. You know, it's like a strange mixture of, of... I mean, when we first saw him in his Kermit the Frog outfit, you know, with the... Um, uh, the Nijinsky <laughs> ballet full, full length thing. I, we thought, Christ, you've got a nerve, and why not? You know, um, I mean, <laughs> just thought, I don't know how I'm going to stop laughing. But it, it was great, and he had such conviction, and he had the talent to back it up. What are the omissions from the set that surprised me? I, I, I was surprised mm. you didn't do um, uh, You're My Best Friend, because that's on Night of the Opera. There are some tracks missing, aren't there? It was the second encore that the BBC missed. Because also, yeah, the I think... Yeah, 45 minute one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Because yeah, yeah. we hadn't given the audience enough at that point as, as a live show, so we went back on, yes, that's right, yeah. thinking... Because yeah. it had actually, you know, the, 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 the broadcast allocation slot, as it were, was an hour. It, it was done, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, so, so the, the BBC had then moved off to the midnight news or something and, yeah. and, and left us there continuing the concert. Yeah. Yeah. So then, Seven Seas of Rye, See What a Fool I've Been, and then you finish with God Save the Queen. See What a Fool I've Been. It's a long time ago, though. It's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. See What a Fool I've Been is a very loose thing as well. I mean, it's a kind of adapted 12 bar. So we were able to stretch out and do lots of, sort of soloing and messing about. Yeah, it's a very slow 12 bar, actually. Yeah. And sometimes it would speed up and go into all, all sorts of different places. memories of following the concert and then going into 76 because that was the big Hyde Park 
moment as well in September that year. Yeah, seventy six. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was massive. I mean, I I was comparing that day, and I remember looking out from the stage and seeing. Well, it was as sort of far as the eye could see. It was Horizon Line. Yeah, yeah I remember people, that. Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was, it and the Horizon was. Line, I think, was Bayswater Road. It was just, yeah. Com- it was solid. And I remember there were people cool. in all of the trees. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Up in the trees. Yeah. And, and they, they made us, the police took us off the stage. They made us uh, cut the show. They short. kind of got frightened, yeah, because mm. it was, yeah. I think, bigger than they'd expected. And there was no limit on the number of people in there. And they slightly panicked towards the end. And, and they yeah. forced us to, they wouldn't let us do an encore because mm. it's in danger of getting out of hand or whatever. So I distinctly kind of was... remember this moment because I had to go yeah. out and yeah. tell everybody that ah, the, there wasn't yeah. going to be any more. Yeah, yeah, we got yeah. piled into a police van yeah. and thrown into a van and bundled <laughs> away. Whooshed out of the, of the, the park. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll teach you for being entertainers. <laughs> 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 all happening now, isn't it? It was. I remember we went on a massive world tour, didn't we? I wanted to do something to say thanks. You know, we've had an incredible mm. year. And we came up with this Hyde Park idea. And that really did kind of consummate us and England, I suppose. Because we, you know, Hammersmith Odeon was nice, but it's... it's how, how many people in Hammersmith Odeon? Three and a half thousand. Three and a half thousand, you know. So we're at a certain level, and a very good level. But coming back to, to that huge audience in High Park, we really felt like we'd sort of like the homeboys had made it in a way. It's great reminiscing, actually, isn't it? It's good looking back so long as you don't stare. But I don't think we've been staring too much, have we? I think we've been enjoying the memories. 